Okay. Um, the sound good for uh, people on, uh, on Zoom? Is, it, is the sound good? Somebody, somebody put a comment? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, so we'll get started. So, so just to kind of recap where we are, um, we started a couple of days ago to develop a time domain version of control theory. And yesterday, well, we, we, we began with some, some heuristic methods of controlling systems, PID control and, and things like that. Um, realized that this was gonna to get too complicated to uh, do for, for larger systems. And then yesterday um, proposed a more systematic approach known as optimal control, where you, you come up with some scalar uh, uh, positive quantity, non negative quantity that we call a cost that supposedly encapsulates what you want to do. And if you want to do several competing things at once, one strategy is just to have a linear combination of, of say, quadratic forms. Um, uh, I should say this is not the only approach, and there's um, uh, a more formal thing called multi-objective uh, optimization, which uses the notion of Greedo frontiers and so forth. But um, the simplest way to have competing gains is just to put everything in terms of the same units, which is to say some dimensionless number, and then add them with some weighting coefficient that weights how much you care about, say, controlling your state versus how much you care about how much control effort is required. That was the trade-off that we were looking at last time. And so optimal control gives the systematic approach. Uh, we even did it for a nonlinear system of swinging up a pendulum. And then for linear systems, we developed a, a complete solution, which even was a feedback solution that allowed us to calculate the gains based on these uh, uh, cost functions. So you transfer the problem of tuning the gains to choosing a cost function, but the hope is that one has more insight into the, the, the costs are supposed to be what you care about. So hopefully you have more insight into that. So today I want to kind of uh, look at the contrasting part of this, which is the problem of how you go from observations to an estimate of the state. So this is the notion of observability, which says that this is, this is possible. We, we talked about that on, on Tuesday. Um, but, and, and we even on Tuesday gave kind of a, a, a solution to doing it, which was the notion of this observer system, if you may remember, um, where we created kind of a shadow dynamical system that works in parallel with the physical system. And the idea was to put coupling of kind of feedback so that the two systems were eventually coupled and synchronized. Okay, and we'll, we'll come back to this in, in, in a couple of minutes, but um, we had kind of a way of of doing that. And today we're going to revisit that and in particular think about the effects of noise. So when we, when we did it before, the feedback coupling was a little bit arbitrary and it wasn't clear, for example, why you wouldn't use huge observer gains to synchronize the systems arbitrarily quickly. And we'll see that noise will tell us that this is a bad idea. And so in order to do this, we need to, to kind of take a step back and, and think about introducing noise into this uh, uh, picture of, of control that we've been developing. So, um, so today is devoted to stochastic systems. And uh, I'll, I'll start it with kind of a, 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 a claim, which is that the, the only reason to use feedback as, as opposed to some kind of feed forward is some kind of uncertainty. Um, and why is that the case? Well. Feedback is always reacting to something. And in a causal system, reactions always take some time. So this can be formalized in things like the kramers kronig relations, or as I said, the, there's a polar version involving magnitude, uh, of the magnitude of a response function and the phase delay. Um, and, and this tells you sort of how much lag there has to be from causality. Um, there can be more lag, but there has to be a minimum, minimum lag. Um, so anytime you do something, but more informally, anytime you're reacting, there's some time to, to gather the information, think about it, and then do something about it. Whereas 
if you do some, if, if you kind of know what's going to happen, you can just implement the right control. So if you know your dynamics perfectly, if there are no disturbances, anything like that, you just compute in the way that we did uh, yesterday, the, the U of T, the control signal that you need to apply, and then you just apply it and it, and it does what you have. Of course, this doesn't work in the real world. The, there's always, uh, uh, the models you use are never perfect. There's always external disturbances and so forth. Um, and so you do need, need feedback, but the feedback is really associated with this uncertainty. And it's always good to realize that the things that you are certain about or know something about should be incorporated and you should be using feedback only for the dealing with uncertainties. Um, so having said that, one other note um, is that I, you know, I mentioned that um, feedback has to be causal in the sense of, of something, something unexpected happens and then you react to it and there's a, there's a causal delay. The interesting thing about control theory, I think, and one that isn't sufficiently appreciated in, in physics, is how, in a way, the, the control can be a causal. But and I, I might have mentioned this at the very beginning, but you know, think about the problem of controlling the temperature of a room like this. Um, you know, uh, uh, if you use feedback to control it, then whenever the temperature goes down in the evening, it's not quite the season, but give it a month or two, when the temperature is going down in the evening, the heater should come on and, and, and warm up the room. On the other hand, you know, we know and, and the heater can easily learn that you know, regularly around sunset, which is a predictable event, temperatures are going to go down. And so if you want to keep the temperature in the room constant, it's better to start heating before the sun goes down you know, so that you, you gradually need just enough to keep the temperature constant. So you can do a better job of control by incorporating, in some sense, information from the future. Of course, it's, it's information that you have from other sources. So the way I like to look at this is that control systems are open to the flow of information in the same way that, you know, in, in, when we think about energy, energy is conserved, but we have open systems where energy can flow in and out. And here we have control systems where there, 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 there is overall causality, but information can flow in in different, in different ways. And uh, I think this is something for the theorists to mm -hmm. kind of think about how to formalize better. Um, you know, we've been having lectures in information theory and when we won't have time to try to connect information theory to control, but it's a natural connection to try to make. And there have been some efforts in doing this, but I think there can be a lot more. Um, and, and, and by the way, uh, many actual thermostats these days, if you buy a, a, a more modern one, they have kind of a learning mode where basically they, they make the onset that, that tomorrow is going to be, you know, we'll have the same disturbances as today or an average version of the last few days. And so even if, you know, you don't have to be that smart a thermostat to, to, to learn a daily rhythm like that. And then once it's learned it, then you can start to, to, to have a control that anticipates that. Okay, so um, uh, what I want to develop is something formally called the Kalman filter, and it can be a little bit forbidding in the algebra around it can be a little bit forbidding. So I want to build up the notion step-by-step step, starting from really simple, simple examples. Um, but the, 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 the issue is going to be, we're going to now consider systems that have, in some sense, two noise sources. So the system itself will be driven by some kind of noise source. And in, in the kinds of experiments that uh, I do and, and Gail does, the, the, this, this can be the thermal noise from uh, a, a, a bath that's connected, for example, to a colloidal particle or talking about protein or uh, other kinds of molecules. So you have a system that's at a finite temperature and subject to in, in the case of a colloidal particle, direct hits from, from the surrounding water molecules that they get one of the around. At the same time, in, in a control system, you're making measurement. If you are going to use feedback, you have to measure, for example, the position of a particle. 
and apply some force. And that measurement will often, will, will, will always have noise in it. So there's always some uncertainty associated with the, with the measurement. In the case of the colloidal particle, typically the, the measurement systems involve lasers and you, 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 you focus light and there's, there's various techniques, but, but you know, in, the, in the simplest thing, you, you form some image on a camera perhaps and you're, you're, you're tracking it. And there's uh, noise associated with the illumination and particularly if the illumination has low power. So you're using a very weak light source um, or you're trying to do very fast measurement, it's, it's kind of equivalent then the shot noise in, in, in the laser becomes uh, uh, important. Um, number of photons detected. And, and in, the, in fact, in the, in the extreme limit, people have done tracking where every photon detected from, from a measurement system is, is active at once. Um, anyway, so uh, the, the, the measurements that you use have noise. And these are two independent noise sources. Um, and the Challenge, one of the challenges would be that, that, that you have the system responding to noise, you have the measurements with noise, and how do you sort everything out? And so I tried to sketch this, this um, situation here, where um, you know, here, here's, here's our physical system. We have inputs, and the, 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 there can be inputs both deliberately because you want to control it, and there can be inputs from noise. And they can enter either in similar ways or different ways to come to them. And on the output, there's, there's measurement noise that leads to an output that um, is uh, uh, different from the state, even in simple cases where you, you think you can observe the whole state vector. So, so remember, we, we put functions between the internal state and what we observe. And up until now, I've been focusing on the, on the idea that, well, maybe you have an n-dimensional state vector, but you're only observing one quantity but you observe it as a function of time. So if you have enough observations, you can use the information from the past to reconstruct the state now. So here we see that even if you have a simple one-dimensional system, which is where we're going to start, and a one-dimensional observation, so the dimensions of the observations equal the dimension of your system, there's still a problem because you, you have noise in that measurement. And so even in this simple case where you think you're observing everything, you know, the, 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 you still have the problem of going from a noisy measurement to an estimate of the state. <clears throat> does, that, does that make sense? This is kind of a, a setup on the problem. Okay, um, and uh, what? Um, I don't. I don't. <laughs> okay, we'll just have to sort of imagine. Um, uh, yeah, I think in, in in my book I have a. Uh, an example where I sketch out um, sort of why you might want to be more sophisticated about um, this process of estimating the state. Um, so so um, think about, for example, a, a noisy harmonic oscillator. So here, here's a noisy measurement of harmonic oscillator. In fact, it, it could even be just a, 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 a harmonic oscillator not driven by noise. It would look something like this. And as I've mentioned, if you were to try to estimate the, the, the velocity of the oscillator by doing a um, you know, sort of naive finite differencing, because you have noise, you're gonna get a really bad result. You know, your, your inference for the velocity will be you know, something like that. And we'll see that if, if you use this a technique that's based on an observer, you get a much smoother estimate because you're implicitly averaging over uh, the noise of the measurement. I mean, in some sense, this is an obvious strategy. If I, you know, if you have a static quantity that you're measuring and there's noise, this is like a first year lab exercise, you know, this is a lab class, what you're told is to measure it n times so that the uncertainty gets reduced by a factor of square root of the number of times you do the measurement. So we'd like to do this for uh, a measurement from say a, a harmonic oscillator, but the problem is that um, you know, it's, it's the thing that you're trying to measure is moving. And so if you just naively took the last n measurements and averaged them, you'd be averaging noise, but you'd also be averaging the motion. And so that's not something that, that is optimal. And so a better strategy will be this observer where you have sort of two systems that are eventually more or less doing the same thing. 
And then the difference is there's something that you can start to average. That. So that's that's kind of the strategy that we'll be pursuing. Okay, so um, uh, let's see how this goes in a, a simple example. So um, let's see. Yeah, so the, the, the thing that we'll be thinking about is a Brownian particle. So it's just diffusing no, no other potential or anything like that. Um, and, oh, sorry, okay, sorry, this is, okay, well, I'm using slightly more general notation than I, I would, but, um, so we have a, a, a particle that's obeying linear equations. It'll, it'll, in the end, in the moment, it'll just be uh, um, a simple diffusion, but, in general, it's AX plus B U. And here I'm, I'm, um, I'm actually giving it sort of two inputs. So there's the, the normal input U, which is coupling to here B prime. And then there's noise, which is thermal noise from the surrounding bath, which is also coupled in the system in principle in a different way. And I really shouldn't write this like this. I should really have just one giant matrix and two inputs like that. Um, but uh, it's, I'll, I'll sometimes abuse this notation. And sometimes the Bs can be the same, and sometimes they can be different. So it just depends on how, you know, U is the deliberate thing you're doing to the particle, so it's a force acting the particle, and U is the forces that are acted on by the water molecules. Yeah. So you, for example, could be a, a force that you are expecting the particle? A force or a... Yeah, so, so in the case of a one-dimensional particle, they're the same. They, 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 Inputs are the same, but you can imagine systems where, um, you know, it's a higher dimensional internal system. Your 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 control enters in one way, but noise can enter in perhaps perhaps the same way as the control, but perhaps in other ways too. And so, in principle, they can couple in differently. But you know, it does. I mean, I'm just trying to be a little general here. It could be the same. So one dimension could be also a for example. Yeah. So one dimension, these would be. Um, and then we're going to set up this observer structure. And you remember that the idea was to make a shadow dynamical system here, where it's the same, it's the same dynamics and the same input. Um, now we can't put the noise into the observer because we don't know what the noise is. But we what we can do is put in this feedback between the, the observation and the prediction. Okay, so we'll have this dual structure of the real physical system here. And the observer system here, and this is coupled. Because remember, the, the x, so the x here, is is becomes a measurement uh, uh, through. This is our usual relationship, but now we're adding some noise to it. Okay, so the, the 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 coupling between the observer and the uh, uh, the observer and the physical system enters through this this term here. So this is, this involves x hat, and this involves y, which involves x. Okay, um, so uh, a lot of what I'll do, I'm gonna be kind of going back and forth between discrete dynamics and continuous dynamics. And there are some subtleties in exactly what's the right way to do it, but let's, let's just be informal and, and, and think of just naively discretized systems. Um, so uh, uh, if, we wanted, if we want to describe the motion of a um, Brownian particle, so a diffusing particle, big, big colloidal bead and moving in water um, just by diffusion. So x, k plus one. So we'll describe things at, at different time intervals, k, delta t, or I think sometimes I use ds. Um, anyway, so, so k times an interval, k, will in, k is an integer that index which time point we're looking at. And so x k plus one is equal to x k, which means that in the absence of noise, the particle is just sitting there. So x k is you know, stationary. Um, but then there's there's a, a noise nu k, which is the amount of thermal fluctuations that that accumulatively affect the particle in the interval delta t. Similarly, y k is is just in this case we'll assume. In some sense, we're directly measuring the position, but there's just some noise. So there's no, because everything is one dimensional, there's no C matrix. And, and if, there, if there were C, it would just be a constant. We assume it would be calibrated thing, so it's one. Okay. So XK is the actual position. 
yk is the measured position, and because of noise, they're different. Um, and uh, the only force affecting the particle is this new k, the thermal. So just a, a brief word on, you know, what do I mean by these noise and their, their uh, stochastic process? And for our purposes, their properties are defined by their statistics. So the average of, of, of new k and ck are zero. So in some sense, that's almost the definition of noise because if it, if it weren't zero, if there were a constant part, we could reabsorb that constant part into the dynamics. Um, so we assume that, that, that they, they always have zero mean. Um, then we can look at their covariances. So this is the covariance between mu and, and, and c at different times or the same time, doesn't matter, they're all zero. So we're assuming that the two noise sources have nothing to do with each other. And this is reasonable because new remembers arising from the fluctuations of water molecules in the bath, and C is arising because of uh, uh, photon number fluctuations in the laser and the resolution of the optics and so forth. So they're really two separate things that determine uh, these two noise sources. On the other hand, um, they have uh, variances. So, so new K and new K prime, um, if K and K prime are the same, so we look at the noise at one particular time point K and square it, then that is something that, uh, that, that, that on average will we'll have some value, I'll call it U squared. However, if we look at the noise at different times, so the noise at this interval, from this interval, the noise from this interval are, are uh, separate. And, uh, and I should say, by the way, um, uh, there, there are subtleties here that, that arise, for example, if you use cameras that integrate a long time and you, you have this interval, this interval, and they share common value and stuff. So, so this, this, this can be not so straightforward in practice, but, but for our purposes, we'll, we'll assume it is. So um, the, the noise, the thermal noises are, are independent, different times, and again, the measurement noise is, is, is different at different times. Okay, and it, it has an amplitude c squared. And it's just c squared because I'm, I'm not assuming that the variance is depending on time, but of course, in a more general formulation, um, the, the actual variance could vary with time. For example, if you were measuring with a laser, the variance depends on the brightness of the laser, so if the laser intensity were changing for whatever reason, then the variance of the noise measurements would also be changing. Um, finally, I mean by when I keep saying average and I use the, the brackets, so in this, this is this notation, I mean an ensemble average. So I mean the integral over all values of the random variable of the random variable uh, times its probability density function. And uh, um, if you talk to, to people like uh, Raphael, you'll, you'll Get a different notation for all of this. So this, this will be what I use. Um, P of nu of k for a Gaussian distribution, which is the, the, the case that we'll be thinking of today, um, looks, looks like this, as we've seen in this before. And another notation which you take, which often pops up, um, is uh, here. Okay, this looks here. Um, is, is here, so nu k is distributed as a, a normal <coughs> distribution with mean zero and variance uh, mu squared. Okay, this is just bits of notation. Um, any, any, any questions so far? I mean, we haven't really done much besides set up some notation. Uh, just a comment on the actual case of a diffusion particle. So we know a little bit more about diffusion particles where the new squared for the thermal noise in some interval, I guess here I'm calling it TS, so I'm going to change the location. Um, in, in this interval TS, it, 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 it's 2D times TS, or, or the, the standard deviation would be the square root of that, and this is just a, a, a typical displacement in a time TS. Um, and we know from, from uh, uh, Einstein relation that, that the D is actually related to the temperature, so it's KB. Boltzmann's constant times temperature divided by gamma. Gamma is a friction coefficient. And for the case of a sphere moving in water, this friction coefficient is set by Stokes' law. 
And so this gamma is six pi times the radius of the sphere times the viscosity of the fluid. Um, so this is so so the this this is the um, coefficient that connects the, the force that you exert on a sphere with its velocity. So it's a completely overdamped case. So you pull it a constant force and you go at a constant velocity, and gamma is the proportionality constant between them. Um, and I, again, for the experimentalists around, uh, just to note that this, this specific result is for a sphere in an infinite ocean. And if you put a sphere, for example, near surfaces, the, 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 the presence of the surfaces adds more drag. And so the six would be somewhat larger. Uh, and so that's a, a fun thing to calculate uh, uh, if you're a theorist uh, to solve that hydrodynamic problem. If you're an experimentalist, it's just annoying. But, um, <laughs> okay. Um, so that's kind of the physical setup. Um, now, when we go to discrete times, we have to think a little bit about timing. And here there are various possibilities. Um, today, I want to use one and tomorrow another. And I, and I apologize if this is confusing, but. Um, there, there, there are reasons for that choice. Um, so there's a question. So, so um, you make a measurement, you do a computation, and then you take some action. In, in this case, we have, we're not getting to control, but let's, let's just say you, you, um, uh, you make a measurement, and then you have to get that measurement into your computer. You have to have your computer do some calculations, and then eventually you do something. The question is, how long does that take versus the time interval between two observations, right? So, so here's the time between two observations, delta t. And you could have a case where you can measure and figure things out in a time that's much shorter than the time interval. Okay. Um, and that's the case that we'll be talking about today. Or you could have uh, a case where it's a significant time, and in particular, Many experiments are designed so that this time is, is, is precisely one time interval, so that you're always kind of one time step off and have to think about a little bit of predicting into the future. Okay, so that's what an ex so, so a typical experiment would do that. Um, and why would it do that? Because a lot of the time that's in here is it's calculation, but a lot of it is also just transfer time from your sensor into your computer. And um, if that time were short between observations, then as you'll see, the ability to control something requires continual information. So if that time were short, then that means that you've acquired some information and then you're twiddling your thumbs for a long time until the next one and then you acquire it. And so why wouldn't you try to acquire it more rapidly? And so you're sort of driven in an experiment to working in a limit where all these times are comparable. And so then, a simple way to design it is sort of to say, well, you know, at this moment, I acquire some information and I start to bring in the computer and I process it and I da da da, and I'm, I'm completely done just at the time that the next one is, is coming in. And so there's this kind of sort of leapfrogging of, of information into one, which is, you know, in some sense a little complicated, but, but what we have to do. So we'll look at here in a case where. Um, we assume that we can acquire the information and, and make use of it instantaneously. But this does complicate the formalism a little bit um, when, you, when you start to think about things like this, because now we should distinguish between two kinds of estimates. So there's the estimate that we can make of the position at a time k plus one, where we are predicting where the system will be at time k plus one, given the best estimate that we have at time k. And then, so we can do this immediately at time k, as quickly as we can calculate at time k, right? So at time k, we have the measurement yk, we can do all of our calculations, and then we can make a prediction for where the system will be at time k plus one. In the case of diffusion, it's a trivial thing because in the absence of, of noise, it doesn't go anywhere. But if there were deterministic forces, we could say, okay, these forces will carry the system in this direction by this amount. You know, given that we think it's here, it will carry it over to here because we know what the force is and so forth. And, and, and the, 
friction is, and so forth. Um, so we can immediately predict where the system will be at the next time step. And then at some and, and then after this interval, the information will come in, the measurement is made, and then we can update it. So there are two quantities. There's x k plus one x hat. So x hat is the estimate. K plus one is for time k plus one, and minus will be in this notation, it's a little arbitrary how you, how you define it, but minus will mean that we're making a prediction and we don't yet have the measurement there. And, and without the minus, it would mean that we, we are now incorporating the, the measurement. So these are, these are actually two quite different quantities, even though they look almost the same. Is that a little bit easy? I mean, I, I, so you are saying that you measure at time k, no? Yes. And you have a result yk. You have a result yk, YK and you use it to make some best estimate xk, x hat k. Okay. In order that. And then you can predict where it will be at k plus one. And that's what I'm calling x hat k plus one minus. Sorry. So, a, 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 this, this value, x k plus one minus, is the prediction or the. It's the prediction. Okay. And the minus means that it's, it's lacking the updated new information. You know, you could argue that okay, maybe I should have not put a minus here and put the plus or the star or something. Anyway, I don't know. These are notations that at least some people use. It, it is what it is. So this is the prediction, right? Prediction here. And then once you get the measurement yk plus one, then you can you can incorporate that into the into the S. So here things are a little bit simple and, and, and some of this degenerates. And if we were just doing diffusion, I could, I could use a simpler notation because x hat k plus one minus is just equal to x hat k because there is no drift in the system, right? It's just diffusion. So, it, so unless there's random forces, it just sits there. Okay, so, so this is, these are equal, but, but, but when there's forces around, they won't be equal. Um, and because the measurements, because we're assuming that we have kind of like a perfect measurement plus noise, then y hat k plus one is just x hat k plus one minus. Okay, so, so y hat k plus one is, is the predicted observation, right? So we can predict the state, but because the state generates an observation, we can predict the observation as well. In this simple case, they're the same. But again, remember before we had y equals cx. So there's some matrix or, 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 or vector, row vector relationship between the n component state vector and say the one component y, a row, so a row vector c. Um, so we can apply that to, to the um, uh, uh, prediction. Okay. Um, so using that, the um, observer then becomes x hat k plus one when you incorporate the measurement. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just uh, you said that uh, without drift, uh, the estimate would just be equal to the prediction. Yeah. No, the, I mean we're trying to formulate a prediction, so I'm saying that the the prediction would just be the previous estimate. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Uh, prediction would be just the previous estimate, but with drift. What would this look like? What well, we'll come to this, ah, but, okay. but but basically it's 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 a deterministic system. Yes. So so I mean drift is the deterministic part of yes. the dynamics. So if you know you, you have the state, so it's you know it's it's basically you know x hat k plus one is a times x hat k plus whatever plus the drift term. Well, no, that is the drift term. The a oh. is the drift term. Okay. The a has the drift term. Okay. okay, I mean if it, if a is just one, then there's and there's no drift. But if A, you know, we've looked at A for a harmonic oscillator and you know we can calculate it for different different things. So A has whatever drifts in plus in addition, if there's an input, that will also create a drift. So for the moment, there's no input, so we're not doing any feedback, and there's no dynamics. So it's just the particle we're diffusing actually just in one dimension, just like that uh, on its own, but it's only moving because of the noise. And the noise is what we don't know. So, um, so we would say that the x hat k plus one 
is the this is the prediction, okay? And now we're going to update our, our estimate after we have made the actual measurement yk plus one, and we compare it to the predicted measurement. Okay, so, so if the predicted measurement, if the actual measurement is numerically equal to the prediction, then we don't do anything. Like we, you know, that basically says that, you know, we, we kind of predicted to be here. And so therefore we predicted an observation and, and we got exactly that value. So no need to do anything. But to the extent that it does differ, then, then we correct it with this, this, this feedback rule with L being in one dimension, just a coefficient that's saying, how much do we, how much do we update X hat on the basis of the new information? And we still have to choose L. That's going to be kind of the, the point of the story. But for now, it's just some coefficient. And we saw before, you know, where, where um, the differences weren't coming from stochastics, but just from different initial conditions, that, that we could choose L in a way that would make everything make the two systems synchronized. So eventually, this, 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 this difference here would be going to zero. But with noise, that's not going to go, it's not going to go to zero, but it'll go to some, some steady state values, average steady state values. Okay. So we're going to adopt an approach very much like the optimal control, but here our cost function is going to be the um, uh, uh, variance of observer errors. Okay, so what we what we do, so we want to again, we want to have a systematic way to choose L. In one dimension, you could just tune it and 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 and, and see where it works best, but when Remember, L will be n-dimensional for uh, uh, an n-dimensional state vector. So, um, again, you know, we want a rational way to choose the gain, and we'll see that 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 we we will have it. So, let's form the error estimate between the actual state of the system x k and our best estimate x hat k, which is incorporating the information at time k. So, this error e k is just the difference. And I want to use the ensemble average of ek squared, the variance of errors, as, as the cost function. Okay, so we want to choose L in such a way that, that our estimates are going to be as close as possible to the true state on average. And of course, we have to square it because it can fluctuate. You know, if it's, if we've done this right, it'll be unbiased, but it will always be fluctuating around. So we, so it's, it's, it's the square that we should look at. Okay, is this making sense? Uh, it's, 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 it's a number of ideas that, that come at once. It sometimes takes a while to think in. Yeah. Can you imagine the virtual steps in the numerical analysis? I'm sorry? Virtual steps in the numerical analysis where you, you have you kind of try to estimate what the next point will be and then you can make several like higher order. Yeah, so there's 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 sort of predictor corrector method in numerical analysis, and this has very much the same kind of deal here. Okay. So um, let me be annoying. Let me let me annoy you and, and change notation slightly, in in a way that's not very natural for physicists, but is is kind of if you ever go to any control theory book, this is what they they use. Um, so instead of writing e k squared plus one, I'll call this p k plus one. So p will be my covariances. Um, I mean, this is all leading up to 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 talking about tomorrow some recent work that we did that we submitted to a physics journal, and they go, you know, one of the referee comments was p. Why did why the heck did you use p? So so they said use how about sigma? So okay, so so you could use sigma for a covariance matrix. Okay. Um, but uh, so you are always d to the average of the square of the error, right? Yeah. So this is the definition. Over, over, over.
Somehow, somehow my cameras don't work. So, no more. It's probably in one. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, p k plus one is error. The square of the error, which is x k plus one minus x hat k plus one squared ensemble average. Um, but we're going to have a whole family of these t's. So, so, so pay attention. So, p k plus one minus will be the same quantity when instead of using x hat k plus one, we use x hat k plus one minus. Okay, so this is the um, covariance in the predictions. Okay, so we so so p k plus one minus is going to be bigger than p k plus one because hopefully when you make the observations, that will that will lessen the error. Um, we can we can express um, e k plus one minus so this this difference here um, in terms of the dynamics so x k plus one is x k plus u k um, uh, and so then uh, uh, then we have x k plus one minus x k hat or x k minus x k hat so that's e k and then we still have this and so if we then look at the uh, squared and take the ensemble average because the noise is independent of the state. Okay, so then you have the state at this time, and the noise is everything that's happening in the interval. So it's independent of what the state is. Then, uh, uh, then this ensemble average is zero. And so we can say that pk plus one minus, for example, is pk plus u squared. Okay, so that tells us precisely how much uh, uh, the uncertainty grows due to the diffusion of the particle. So you have an estimate. To within some precision, and then as the um, as you sit for a time interval t sub s, then it becomes larger. It diffuses, so you, you you're less certain about where it is. Okay, after measuring uh, the the making a measurement at y at time, measurement y at time k plus one, then the error is going to be um, we'll have x hat x k plus one minus. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the old prediction plus the, the correction. And so again, we can, we can take yk plus one and express it as xk plus one plus the measurement noise and gather all the terms. And so we can relate this in terms of uh, e, the, the predicted error and the measurement noise. And, and, and now we see that the, that the um, observer gain is, is entering into, into both of these terms. And so when we squared in particular, we'll have uh, a quadratic form or quadratic result where this is one minus L squared, this is L squared. Um, so we can see that, that um, uh, using this observer is going to increase our uncertainty because we're amplifying noise in the measurement, but it's going to decrease the uncertainty in the previous thing to come because we're incorporating new information. So it, it, it can be both helpful and hurtful and, and, and harmful. And that means that there's an optimal value of the observer gain. So you're, you're, 
you're basically balancing the incorporation of the new information, which to the extent that it's, it's good information will improve your estimate, but to the extent that it's noise will, will um, worsen it. Okay? And so this, we now have a way to sort of balance these two competing effects. Okay, so um, uh, again, you know, just the, the um, So here we have ek plus one minus, and then we also have it here. So, so it's one minus L times this, and then we still have L times the, the noise here. So it's, it's, it's entering in both cases. So is, is that part clear? Again, and conceptually, the, the conceptual part is more important than the algebraic manipulation. Um, so um, yeah, to the extent that you have new information, so if there were no measurement noise, then the new information would, would improve your estimate of where it is. Um, but when you do, so, so that's, that's incorporating the, because it's reflecting also the effects of the thermal noise. So it's giving you information on what the thermal noise is during the interval because you're observing it after the thermal noise has acted on it for that time. So that part of it is helpful, but, but the fact that the observation is noisy is harmful because that will that will give you a Y that's unconnected to the system, and so it will worsen your your estimate. So that's why there's an L squared C squared, and then this part here is coming because you're 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 learning about the thermal fluctuations that happen during the time interval. Okay, so so it's kind of there are two noise sources, and so we're getting information about one, but we're exposed to the effects of the other, and we want to balance. <laughs> I'm a little worried here. Uh, I've been following you back. Okay, but this is the, I, mean, I have to say, I, we don't have too, too far to get today in terms of the essential things, but this is, this is sort of, in some sense, the key point. So I really want to stop and make sure that, that, that if there are questions at this stage that we answer, them, because mind, it's only going to get. Would you mind to make a brief, brief summary of what we have to talk about? The, a brief summary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, for the state of a dynamical system, so this, in this case, it's a particle diffusing in one dimension, um, and the problem, and and so, uh, and and we're making observations of this. The problem is that the system has sort of two types of noise. The, the particle itself is moving in a random way because of, of thermal fluctuations. So it's, it's diffusing on a line. However, your observations that you make of it are also noisy. So you're not getting precise information about the state of the system. If you, if you had no observation noise, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. Okay. But the problem is that, you know, it's, you're, you, you know, the observations are different from it. From, from the actual system. So you're trying to make inferences about the state of the system um, using uh, what you know about the dynamics, which is that in this case, it's just not going to, it's just that it's not going to move unless there's thermal noise, plus the observation, you know, the fact, plus the noisy observation. And so we're, we're trying to, um, so our strategy then is to define this observer. So we have the two parallel systems going together. And it's a little bit overkill in this, in this special case where I mean, really the observer is, is, is designed to um, apply in a system where the state is moving in some deterministic way. Okay, so here the state is not moving in a deterministic way, it's just sitting there deterministically. So um, it's a little bit heavy structure but, but in general, we'll, we'll have that structure. So we set up this observer, which is trying to synchronize with the system. And so we have the true state of the system, and then we have the state of the observer system. So this is X and X hat. And as they march along in time, um, 
the observer learns about the system through the observations. And so it's, it's getting an observation and then the observation tells it where the system, you know, if the observation were perfect, then if it moved randomly, the observation would just track that. But it doesn't, it, it gives you imperfect information about it. And so it sort of tracks it. I mean, the noise is very small, mostly it'll be tracking it, but there'll be a little bit of fuzziness. And so we try to put this together in an estimate of what the variance is between our estimate of the system and the actual measurement. We can do this in a theoretical way because we, 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 you know, we can write down the noise sources. We don't know them in practice, but we can then take ensemble averages and, and know statistically what to expect. And what we, what we find is that Zoom does not work very well. <laughs> Uh, and work reliably. What we find is um, Sharing ended unexpectedly. We need to reboot this device and we cannot start broadcasting this one. But yeah, we can not just do that. Okay. Um, sorry. So um, yeah. So 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 we have an expression for. Um, okay, so we got down to, to here. And so this is an expression for the the variance um, of our estimate at time k plus one um, in terms of the prediction and. Uh, uh, the properties of the noise and, and the observer gain. Okay, and so um, uh, if we, so, so then L is still a number that we have to choose. And so now we're gonna to try to choose it to minimize. To minimize. Okay, so this, this, is, this is just the calculus. And so you take the derivatives that is equal to zero and solve for L. And then you get, you get this and you can even take a second derivative and show that it's positive so that we just found a local minimum. Um, and, um, and then go back and then having the value of L, you can substitute back into the uh, uh, previous formula, which depended on L but using L star, the optimal value. And, uh, uh, and so then we get in the end, going through some algebra, um, that p k plus one star is actually just c squared times l k plus one star. So there's a, an optimal value of the gain which can, which can differ at different times. So that's why it's indexed by by k. Um, however, if you keep iterating this, and if your system is is stationary in the sense that the statistics don't are independent of time, then it will go to a, a steady state value, and um, we can we can find it because we, we now have explicit and we've lost it. Okay, I'm sorry. What's going on here? The connection is very Yes. Okay. Um, Okay. Um, so we have, uh, uh, so we can, we, we can iterate this and, and solve for the steady state value and that will, 
you do these, these equations. Um, and so when you substitute it in, you, you, you actually get an explicit solution for the steady state value of this gain. And I've, I've defined a kind of signal to noise ratio, or sometimes people will call the signal to noise or signal to noise ratio squared, but it's the ratio of the, so the signal here is the actual movement that we're trying to detect. The noise is the noise of the measurement. So, so one noise is our signal that we're trying to learn about, which is thermal fluctuations, and one noise, so that one, yeah, that's our signal, and then the other is the observation noise and so the noise. So the ratio is a good quantity to, to look at. It's dimensionless, and so, um, so we take the positive root of the quadratic and, and we get an explicit expression for L star. So um, it's interesting to look at this in, in different, uh, um, uh, different limits. So in the limit where alpha is much larger than one, so this means that the thermal fluctuations are very large, the measurement noise is very small, then L star in this formula goes to one and, and the P goes to, the, to C squared, which is the measurement noise. So it just says that this, this is kind of the usual situation that, that people kind of implicitly assume applies, the kind of naive situation where basically you just have measurements and you assume that your measurement is the actual thing, you know, the actual state of the system just fuzzed out by some noise, okay? But it's more subtle when these are comparable. And in the limit, for example, where um, alpha is much less than one, so this says that, that uh, uh, you know, you've got very small thermal fluctuations and huge measurement observations. So your, your observations are kind of, you know, almost always sort of statistically the same. And there, there's just a little bit of underlying motion underneath the mean. Then it says, basically, you want to trust your model more than the observations. You kind of want to ignore the observations pretty much and, and, and go with the prediction. And so what we have is kind of a weighting between them, but in the limit of, of infinitely noisy observations, you just, you know, if you knew your observations were, were infinitely noisy, that means they're useless, so you should just ignore completely those observations. Um, uh, what, the, what, 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 what this exercise that we've been going through does, though, is say that for finite amounts of both noise, you should, to some extent, base your estimate on your predictive prediction, which comes from the model, and to some extent on the measurement, which is sort of the, the, the naive thing that one might be doing in, in a physical experiment. And that incorporating the prediction from the model in that sense can, can improve what you would, would get uh, otherwise in the, in the naive version. There's an interesting kind of analytic result that's also nice in this limit, which is that L star, again, we're, we're, we're just looking at, we're just looking at the solution of this in limits of alpha being bigger than one or smaller than one. If L star goes to the square root of A in this limit, and P star, the variance then is, is U times C, or if we go back to real units for diffusion, this is the uncertainty in the, in the position would be some kind of geometric mean between uh, uh, the, the thermal diffusion and the um, uh, measurement noise. But remember, thermal diffusion was already square root of 2dps. So now we're taking the square root of that. So we have a, a one quarter power here. So, um, so what's interesting is that the uncertainty um, is, is um, only very weakly scaling with the diffusivity of the particles. So it can be, you know, 10 to the 10,000 times, you know, you can increase E by a factor of 10,000 times and only lose, like, get a factor of 10 in, in uncertainty. Uh, and so that, that sort of opens up the possibility of, of tracking sort of very rapidly diffusing objects. Um, and, uh, and so that's something that's been exploited in, in, in a number of experiments, uh, particularly in, in biophysical experiments where you're tracking a fluorescent label. So um, you want to keep the illumination low because there's photo bleaching and the, the molecule gets damaged. So you have very noisy <laughs> observations. Um, and nonetheless, in, in, in the limit, people have been able to track, it, it was pretty amazing, individual mole dye molecules diffusing in water. So really very, very high diffusion coefficients, like 400 microns squared per second. Those who 
who know these things, um, and yet one can actually track them with, with uh, even detecting only a thousand photons per second. Uh, anyway, and then it's coming from the scale. Um, one can, of course, just just plot these results, and so this is the this is the one limit here. This is the other limit here, and, and there's just some curve connecting them. Um, as a function of alpha. And then one can also track the corresponding um, variance in units of, of C squared and, and, and so on. Um, now, another kind of point of view of this is to, is, is to not explicitly discretize in the way that we just did, but to think of the system as kind of hybrid dynamics. So we have in this kind of mode, um, a system that's continuously diffusing, which is what the real system is doing. And then we're getting information at it periodically. Our first approach was to sort of take the equations of motion and kind of figure out some way to discretize them and find them to go through. But you could also treat it as a continuous stochastic process and um, uh, track, for example, the, the, the growth of, um, so then the variance would just grow with the time interval between the last measurement and the next measurement. Um, this is nice if you're doing things like um, uh, measuring it photon by photon, so reacting every photon, but the interval between photon arrivals is random, so you don't have periodically spaced measurements, but they're just whenever the next photon happens. So you can, you know, by, by thinking of, by keeping track of the underlying continuous process a little more carefully, you can, you can accommodate those. Okay, um, and, and this would involve uh, solving the, 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 what's called the Fokker Planck equation for the probability density of where the positions are. In this case, it's just a diffusion equation for, for, for this probability density. So that's, that's for those who are a little more expert. Okay, um, one thing that's, you know, as I mentioned, that this is a kind of averaging. And it's useful to try to relate what we're doing here to ways of computing an average. So let's throw away the dynamical part and just imagine that we wanted to measure something constant and we're just repeatedly measuring it. We measured n times. We know from first year lab courses that, that the uncertainty goes down as growth of n, and this is a good thing to do. Um, so let's, let's just see how this arises in this kind of formalism. So, in this case, we have constant, uh, um, constant dynamics. The, the quantity is just stationary. There's no noise source here, but we do have measurement errors and, and, and so on. Um, and so we can, we can uh, um, use the same results that we just got, except that now we just take mu equal to, to, to zero, which means that alpha goes to zero. And in that limit, we can, I'll, I'll, I'll spare going through the details of the algebra, but, but we can you know, re, um, rewrite our estimator updates. Um, and what we get then is um, xk plus one is k over k plus one x hat plus k plus one there. So, so these are an explicit expression for the um, uh, time dependent gain. So before we were solving for an infinite amount of time and looking at steady state. Here we're going to keep track of the L's, and we see that the L's, in fact, so this is this is uh, uh, um, L star is going as one over k plus one, and so it's a time dependent game. It's going to eventually be zero. That's what that formula gave us for alpha equals zero. Um, it'll eventually be zero, but but at finite time it has a finite value. And um, to get some insight into where this comes from, let's think about averaging something, which is essentially the right thing to do. Um, we can write an average over k plus one time steps as just the sum of all the x's divided by k, k plus one. Right, that's the, the temporal average. Sorry? Temporal average. Yeah, so this is, this is what we mean by taking an average over, in this case, k plus one measurements. Um, but I want to write this in a recursive fashion. So I can write this, this sum, I can just take the first k components, and then here's the last one. Um, and then this k component, I multiply and divide by k so that I have now the average, the old value. So it's 
So, so, so then I have, um, uh, I, I can rewrite this then as x hat k plus one is the old average plus a, a correction term with amplitude one over k plus one with the new information, which is a, x k plus one, which is kind of like the new measurement minus the old uh, uh, estimate. Okay, so um, uh, what we've done really is, you know, so, so we have a recursive algorithm and this recursive algorithm is something that you can always do at least, at least for linear systems. It's if you're for, for, for nonlinear cases, but you can you can always re you know rework any kind of linear estimation algorithm either as kind of a batch method or a um, uh, recursive algorithm. So another context where you're you're used to this as a batch algorithm is curve fitting. So people have done like you know take pigs and data and fit a straight line through it. And get the best estimate of the slope and intercept. Again, this is kind of a standard lab course exercise. I know you have been just trying to see if other people that, that right. Okay, so you might not know, but it but it's actually true that you can do that algorithm recursively. So imagine that you, you take a whole bunch of data points and you, you fit a line through through the data points and you get the best slope and intercept. Um, and now you take another point. Okay, you could just go back and redo the curve fit with n plus one points instead of n points, but it turns out you can reformulate the curve fitting algorithm in much the same way that we've been doing so that you take your old slope estimate and then add in a correction which is based on a new data point relative to, to, to what it would be predicted to be. Okay, so, so again, you can go back and forth between batch algorithms where you take all of the measurements at once and do an estimate and recursive algorithms where you, you update it. You, know, you have your best estimate and then you get some new information to update it and you get new information to update it and you keep going in this kind of broad way. Okay. And, and with linear algorithms, this always works. So things like uh, uh, linear curve fits and, and uh, the coefficient center linearly and in this here, uh, they're, they're, they're all kind of related. Okay, so um, so this is a special case, and now I want to kind of um, briefly go through the, the general case again, not paying as much too much attention to the algebra, which is which is here if you want to go through it, but but sort of the, the main results, and it's really the same picture, but just more notation. Any questions over before? So, so nothing, nothing conceptually is going to change here with the formula that you get more complicated. Okay, so the general case, you know, we have we have dynamic this is now an n-dimensional state vector. We've got an n by n dimensional matrix. We've got our, our coupling coefficient, which could be a matrix if u if u is a vector, then then you know u has several inputs, then then matrix. Uh, we, we do have in some sense these two inputs, so we could have a matrix that corresponds to both of them. <clears throat> we have our outputs y the, that, that are measured through a matrix C to X. And, and again, there's noise. Uh, the, the, the averages of the noise are zero. The, 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 the noise sources are independent. And then they have magnitudes now, which are, are set because now we're, we're dealing with, for example, in, in the thermal noise, we have um, N components then in principle, we should specify the, 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 um, the noise on each component of the state vector. And so we, we take mu k times its, its transpose uh, uh, and form a, a matrix. And they, again, this just says that you have to look at things at the same time. The thing, things, noise components at different times are independent, but at the same time, they're related by some matrix, which has to be in general, um, Positive symmetric and uh, uh, at least positive semi definite. Um, it could be just a diagonal matrix, so I mean, just, just a variance for each component. Um, and similarly for um, the observation. So I'll have Q nu for the variance of the covariance matrix of the uh, thermal noise, and so C for the C for the variance covariance of the observation. These were just one. 
or some number, these would be just mu squared and c squared before. Um, and if we take into account, like if we've written it here, implicitly we've sort of put the B matrix inside so the Q would then just be B times B transpose times the scalar for example, the one component entering two, two standard B. Okay, so um, so it's slightly more general, but the but the but the the way to proceed is exactly the same. We form a prediction. Um, okay, so Well, things are gone. This is with the one. Now, this is with the other ones. I could try that. Yeah, I think I can. Yeah. I could switch to Edu on the Let, let, let's see if this is Roman and Yeah, because initially I didn't even see the network at all. And I, then I asked the log on to the other one. Okay. Yeah, it's just a connection to the number. Um, okay, so we're sorry, so we're back. Um, yeah, so, so the prediction here is again, just you take your old estimate and your known inputs and you update it to make a prediction. So now the state is no longer the same as it was for diffusion, but, but we're taking the, the known deterministic parts of the equation. So you are saying that the, you are saying, okay, we know the dynamics, so we predict <laughs> our state by using only the dynamics, not the theoretical dynamics. Yeah, because we don't know the noise. And moreover, we do know that the noise has zero mean. So, so that would be the best prediction that we can do. Um, so this gives us our x, k plus one. And then we update it when we do make the new measurement. In, in the same uh, uh, way where we take the, the prediction and then correct it by something that's proportional to the difference between the actual observation and the observation that we would predict using the, the prediction of the state. Sorry, a lot of predicting here. Um, so we take C times X hat K plus one minus, which is what we would predict. So, so this is the prediction. We multiply it by C to make an output. And so therefore that's the output that we're expecting to see. And then we compare it to what we actually measure and it's this difference that we're trying to use as feedback to make a better estimate. Well, have you said that uh, the C times X hat is to be multiplied by the Y? Or would you say? No, this no, no, Y is equal to C ah. times. So, so this is the so so y hat is what we're predicting to measure, right? So, so this is the state that we're predicting, but the state isn't the measurement. And remember, state is you know, for example, x hat might be n dimensional and y is one dimension. And it could be one component or it could be some 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 relation, some function of all these state variables. Um, but it's a different it's a different piece, and so so we have a different name. So it's what we're expecting. The measurement to be at the next time, having taken into account all of the deterministic parts that would affect what the measurement would, would be. Um, if it's a harmonic oscillator again, and we're measuring the position, then you know, and it's connected to you know some, some spring is making it oscillate, then you know it's what the spring is expected to pull the position to be. But then, then there's uh, both thermal noise. 
on the on the this system and observation noise, which is going to make y different from what we expect. Okay, and so now L here, you know, if you're keeping track, has to be a vector, a column vector. So it's going to be an n-dimensional column vector um, for a one-dimensional observation, or it can be an n by whatever p matrix if we have p observations. We'll stick with one. Okay, so then the rest of the calculation really is very much the same. And again, I don't really want to go through all of the algebra because it's, 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 it's the same things, but we form a PK, which is now the, instead of the square of the, of the error, it's you know, the error is the difference between X, XK and its, its estimate. And so we turn that into a covariance matrix by multiplying by its transpose, outer product. Um, and this gives us a, a matrix PK, which is symmetric because of the definition. And then we also have all of its spam, you know, relative to PK plus one minus, where we're using instead of, you know, XK minus this, we're using the prediction minus. Um, and then we can, we can use all of the dynamics to kind of simplify this and, and, and get to a relationship for the prediction here, where the predicted variance at time K plus one is the old variance now dynamically evolved by the A matrix plus something proportional to the um, covariance of the observation. Okay, so it's a fancy way of just saying before, before there, there was no A, the A was just one, so we didn't have to worry about this. And so it was the old variance plus something proportional to the variance, plus, plus the variance of the uncertainty. Here, we've got some matrices and we've got some dynamics, but otherwise it's the same thing. Okay, and then you do the incorporation. Okay, and again, it gets, again, the, the, the details get complicated, but the concepts are the same. So we have the, the error here and we, we correct it. You know, we, we have our, uh, 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 we want a best estimate, which is written in terms of the prediction and the correction. And it's useful to, to, to um, give a name to the difference between the um, actual measurement and the um, predicted measurement, which we call the innovation, and again, just jargon, it's the innovations. Um, so if we define that as a variable, then we can, we can go through and evaluate what that covariance is. And it's, again, kind of complicated in detail, but, but it's really just the same terms that I was talking about before, that it, Involves and, and so I think I'll yeah I think I want to skip to the to maybe the summary maybe this, this will be easier um, okay so just gathering all of these together um, uh, we have uh, the the um, this 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 is the mean of the states so this is how we make the prediction. This is what we predict for the observation. This is the, the state covariance that we predict. Um, this is the covariance of the um, innovations. So this is the, 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 the difference between the observation and the predicted observation has errors. It's across the way it has a variance, the covariance. Um, and then there's a kind of uh, a covariance between uh, the state and the observation. So that's also something that we'll need. And so you put all of these together and then choose L by taking a, a derivative in the same way, then um, we get a, an expression for the, for the optimal gain, which is now a, a vector or possibly a matrix. And then using that value in here, we get uh, the, 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 the prediction for the state itself. And we also get a prediction for the covariance incorporating the observation. And so this is the one that's sort of interesting to, to look at. So it's, it's A times the old prediction times A transpose. So this is just the time evolved. Uh, uh, so this would be the change in uncertainty due to the dynamics. So if the dynamics, you know, take different. So if you have, if, 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 if the position is here and the position is here, which it might be because of uncertainty, then there'll be a different force here from the force here, 
And so after a certain time, this distance, for example, may grow or shrink, depends on the, on the dynamics. Okay, so the dynamics will take a spread of X values and change them over time because different forces are acting on different positions. And so that's the meaning of this, this term here. Um, then there's another contribution from the disturbances that, that, for example, the diffusion processes will just make the uncertainty spread over some time. On the other hand, um, when we make an observation, we reduce the uncertainty because now we have new information that happened, for example, after the donor disturbance. And so then this is, this is the, the sort of negative contribution or the, the, the good part coming from the observation. Okay, and so, um, uh, so this gives us, again, a set of time-dependent variances which can go to a steady state. And when you have a steady state, then, then, then this, these just become P stars. We, you know, the, the K plus one K indices go away. Um, and uh, um, yeah. now what, what you might not pick up on immediately um, because, because L and K are, are, so L is also related to the P's, is that this is essentially just in a slightly disguised form, the same kind of Riccati equation that we had for the um, controlled problem that we did last time. And if you remember the comments that the discussion we had about duality, that you could think of a system being controlled as dual to one being observed, where we make a set of the A goes to A transpose, the input goes to the output. In this case, the control will go to the um, uh, observer gains. So if you make this correspondence, it's formally exactly the same problem. And so in some sense, we have to have uh, uh, the same thing. Um, and so you can, you, can, you can write this out in a slightly more uh, uh, explicit form for a continuous system. And then you can really see if you compare this equation to what we had for, for S, that S matrix, the last time you'll see it's, a, it's, a, it's the same equation once you make these uh, um, you know, A goes to A transpose and B goes to C transpose and so forth. Um, so the, the problem of estimating the state is dual to the problem of controlling. And so again, this goes back to this idea that, that um, when you're, you know, when you have a system, you're observing it in the past in order to control it in the future. And if you kind of flip around the direction of time, you know, you're taking that, uh, uh, you know, it's like now the, the, the control part is the observation, this is the, the control. So in retrospect, it shouldn't be surprising that, that you end up with the same thing, but if you haven't thought about it, it should be completely surprising that you get the same complicated equation describing how you you know, what's the best way to use information about observations in order to estimate the state? Turns out to be basically the same problem as um, what's the best gains to use in order to, 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 to minimize some cost function for the, for the state and, and, and the controller. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, so, so you can then put this all together and um, try to control this. So you have a system now, you're making observations. And yesterday, for example, we assumed that you just observe the state. But now we have a way of taking a sequence of observations and turning it into an estimate of the state, even in the presence of, of, of thermal noise and measurement noise. And then we can also have the problem now of, of trying to control uh, uh, using, for example, that estimate as our uh, state. In, 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 the, in the feedback law. And um, again, I think I, I, I wanted to save time for, for a couple of things again. So I think I'll, I'll go very quickly through this because the, the end result is something very simple, which is that these two problems in a linear system decompose and can be treated separately. So you can do exactly what I just said of um, running this Kalman filter, which name for this, this procedure that I, I've just described and using it to form an estimate of the state at some time. And then you can do what we did yesterday, which was sort of assume that at every moment in time, you know what the state is 
and design a feedback law for it. And it's not obvious and in general not true that these problems decouple, that, that, that you can separately estimate the state and then use that estimate as if it were a perfect measurement. And that's the optimal thing to do. In general, it won't for a nonlinear system. But for linear systems, these problems really do separate. And so there's this separation principle which, which occurs. Um, so, so I go through this a little bit in, in the notes, um, but since the result is, is, is quite simple, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll skip past this. Okay. Um, so then, um, yeah, and, then, and in particular, I kind of, I go back to this one dimensional example and try three different strategies uh, one is just sort of assuming that we have perfect information, this is what we had before, and then this leads to an expression for the variance of, uh, uh, so now we're trying to control a particle, and the overall question is how, how well can we keep the particle at a given position, given that it's being subjected to uncertainties, uh, that we're measuring it discreetly at, at intervals of delta t, so we're not controlling it during those intervals. And also that uh, there's there's observation noise. So if, you, if there is no observation noise, then you can compute what the variance is. Um, if you use the observations naively, so this is what I would call naive feedback, where um, so you're so the feedback is just to to apply negative control to push it back to the origin. And you can do this using the measurement and then basing the feedback on the measurement. That's what I'll call the naive approach. And so you can you can explicitly model what that does here and you get another expression for the variance which is which is um, higher and also when you when you look at the the value of the control that you use would be would be a lower gain and that corresponds to a higher variance and then you can do this with the whole observer structure that we just sketched out and show that it it um, uh, it, it sort of is optimized with the same gain that you would get from, from the, the naive picture, although the variance is still higher because of, because of the extra noise sources. Um, so um, uh, that's try to try to just illustrate this, this uh, separation principle. And then and then of course you can go through the general formalism again. Again, the algebra is not so not so pleasant, but um, uh, the, the, the end result, as I said, is, is quite simple. Um, so here's an example, by the way, where this separation principle would not work, just to kind of convince you that it's a special result for a linear system. So imagine that you were trying to um, uh, control the position of a particle that was naturally bound to the origin here. So this is x dot equals. Um, I lost the connection. Well, let me, let me say the words while it's trying to. Oh. Okay. Um, Okay, well, so, so yeah, so, so, so this example, um, so we have a particle that would naturally relax to the origin here. Um, we can control it, we can push it around, but there's also thermal fluctuations. But now the observation is, let's say somebody puts a little screen, which I've kind of sketched in blue, so you can't see it at all in this interval, but you can see it when it's, when it's here or here. And so, the, I mean, without going through a, a formal calculation, you can sort of see that that the best thing to do for control, particularly if you're trying to if you care about minimizing the amount of control that you use, is to do nothing when it's inside here because you really have no information at all about where it is, and only try to apply control when you, when you can actually see it. Okay, and so in this case, the feedback mechanism has to know about this screen and the observations about when to apply the feedback or not. So it violates the separation principle. So the point is just that that you know this 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 idea that you can sort of treat the estimate you know, 
make your best estimate and then just kind of use it naively, assuming that it's kind of like perfect information, only is only works for the linear system in general. And otherwise you have to you have to think about it in a case by case basis. Okay. Um, I wanted so so I'm still let's see. Yeah, so we just have a couple of minutes. So I just want to uh, sketch a, 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 a couple of generalizations, a generalization and a um, uh, one, 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 one fun example um, about, about controlling the stochastic system because uh, uh, there's some, some interesting features that happen. So, um, so, we're, so, so let's go back to um, just the control problem and forget about measurement noise and so forth, just to simplify by. Um, but now let's think about situ situations where the dynamics that we're interested in are, are nonlinear in some, in some way. Um, so, so we have x i to the f of x plus some, some noise, which has, has the usual properties. In a continuous time, the independence of noise at different times, delta function at t minus t prime. So uh, the, 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 the noise is only correlated at, at that instant. Um, so one can go back to this uh, uh, Bellman principle that we talked about last time and, and redo it for stochastic system. So we remember that one of our concepts was the cost to go function. So this is the, the, the cost to um, uh, reach the final. So the final goal is time tau, we're at some time t before it. So we're interested in, in the costs and the final part of the interval. And so um, uh, before we expressed it in terms of the, the terminal costs plus the, 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 the running costs. And now in a stochastic system, we can, we can, we can define the cost as being the, the expectation value of this repeated over many trials. Uh, so, so, so this is our cost to go. And in the same way that we proceeded last time, we would try to choose a U of T in this that would minimize this cost to go. Okay, so again, how to do it is, 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 is not entirely obvious, but you can choose out of all the possible controls you apply between now and then, you choose the one that minimizes, we'll call this J star, where we've done this search over all possible controls that we would apply during this interval. So it's a lot, it's a continuous infinity of functions, so it's a lot. Um, and so, um, uh, we, you know, the, 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 the idea is that when you add noise to the system now, this will produce some kind of uh, uh, extra diffusion in, in the state, which is going to be something like mu squared times the time interval. Um, and so the, um, the idea is that we should expand this expectation of J at, at different positions to second order in, in, in delta x because the contribution from delta x to the square root of t. So if we're looking at what happened in the time interval t, it should go out to, to second order. And the, the, the upshot is that we end up with this hamilton jacobi bellman equation, which now has an extra term, which is proportional to the to sort of the, the, the second derivative of j, which is coming from, 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 from the expansion due to, to the noise. Um, and so this is just sort of one more term in our equation, which is sort of representing the diffusion that's happening because of the noise in, in the dynamic. Uh, so this is known as the stochastic Hamilton-Jacobi Bellman equation, and um, and I just wanted to show how this what, what this can kind of lead to a choice. Uh, <laughs> qui est le réseau roux, RCOO, Medijana. Okay. Network. Which we use uh, something 21. Because it's RCOO, Medijana is good. Okay. No, no, I'm on. It's just, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to show this now. Um, so let's just do one problem just to give a kind of taste of what, what can happen in 
um, more complicated situations. So imagine that um, we have a particle that is in one dimension um, just drifting deterministically, but in the other dimension it's diffusing. I know it's a little artificial, but you just try to have some simple, simple dynamic. And so it's it, it's it's diffusing up and down, and uh, we can also apply a force on it up and down. And the goal is to make it pass through one of two holes when it gets to the end. Okay, so it's going to take a deterministic amount of time to go from here to here. And while it's doing, it will sort of be drifting up and down. And if it didn't do anything, it would probably just hit the wall. But if we gave it some forces, it could go through either this hole or this hole. Okay, and so the goal is to make sure that it goes through one of those two holes. We don't care which one. Um, and to use the minimum amount of force to, to do this. Because in some sense, one strategy would be to wait just until you're, you're right next to the screen and then use a huge amount of force to, you know, in an instant push it to, the, to one of those holes. So that's a possible strategy, but if it costs you to use U, like if we have something proportional to the integral of U squared, then it's not a good, good choice. Okay. And it starts sort of at the uh, okay, well, while it's while it's booting. So you've got the two, you know, you've got a particle it's starting in the middle between two holes. It's gonna it's gonna hit it at some some known time. You can put diffusion in here to make that uncertain, but but that's not so important. So it'll hit it at a known time. It's diffusing like this, and you can push it up and down as well. And the goal is to make it go to one of these holes. So um, yeah, but, but I don't understand that it's possible that it doesn't enter in the holes, like it should just yeah, if, if you don't do anything, it'll diffuse and randomly hit. The wall. And in fact, we're going to make the holes infinitesimally okay. small. So with, with probability one, it's going to hit the wall. Okay. Yeah, the internet's not working so well. No. Both papers were in They're going to be infinitesimally small. Smaller than this. Oh, shoot. Well, I think I'm, I might be the only person with this. Yeah, we think with the one. Well, I don't know. I don't know if a wireless can allow that. I guess that's what wireless is. Okay. So that's the first one. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so times zero is at x equals zero. Um, the motion is given by this, so the the, the velocity is either given by whatever you put in this control or by the diffusion term. Um, at some time tau, we want it to be precisely plus or minus one. Okay. And the noise follows this uh, uh, diffusion form. And our cost is going to be uh, uh, r, well, I'll, I'll give it a coefficient, but a half r u squared. Okay. And so the cost to go is the integral from time t to tau of this this function here. We can put this into this uh, uh, stochastic uh, um, hamilton jacobi bellman equation. And so this is our running cost. It's in terms of the J star, which we're trying to figure out. So we have a, a, a derivative here times u, which we had before. And now we have a second <coughs> derivative or the diffusive term that involves the noise d. Um, and so the first thing you have to do is minimize this with respect to u what we were doing last time. And so there's no constraints and stuff. So you can actually just solve it here by taking the derivative, so that's fine. And then you <coughs> for, for u here, and then you get this awful looking uh, partial differential equation here, uh, which is which is dj star dt, but now we've got a dx j star squared. So the square of the derivative and then a second derivative term. So this looks kind of hopeless. But then there's a miraculous change of variables that I will 
a, a kind of miraculous change of variables that you can do that I will let Raphael answer any questions about <laughs> of the Kohlhoff transformation uh, about you know when and where when and where this would would help. Um, but it but it but it it works for an equation of this form. So we let j be minus lambda log psi, where psi is going to be our new variable. And in terms of this new variable, lo and behold, we have a linear diffusion equation. So we've taken this nonlinear partial differential equation, taken a nonlinear coordinate transformation, and poof, it becomes a linear equation that we can actually solve. Um, and again, I, I leave it to people like Raphael to explain you know, why this transformation exists but, for this problem. But not for all e element, there is a relation between. Not for all D, L, and the uh, relation between D, L, and one. Yeah, yeah, but but they were saying, but it, but but this works to linearize the point. Yes, yes. Um, and but you know what classes of equations are, you know, have this wonderful transformation is a separate story. But here, you know, a little bird told 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 us to do this, and, and we're happy. Okay. Um, so now we just have to solve the diffusion equation. Notice that there's a minus sign. So again, as is usual in these problems, we're solving it from the goal back in time. Um, and so it's a diffusion problem backwards in time from a starting point given by this sum of delta functions. So that's something that one can solve uh, for psi and then, and then turn it back into an equation for, for, for j. And, um, the, the, the interesting thing is the result here, where if you plot the J star and the corresponding U, which is for right, it's, it's, it's derivative, it goes from a quadratic looking thing to a quartic to a double well shape. So exactly like a phase transition, free energy in a phase transition. And so the, the feedback law that is associated with it um, goes from a linear feedback law, just, just like we've been talking about, to something that's quite Nonlinear, and what this means in terms of our problem is that the right strategy basically is to do essentially nothing and and weakly confine the particle to to a mean at the same position. So it's excellent, but, but confine it weakly enough that the diffusion, the the, the, the typical um, variance is about the width of the slits, so that by diffusion it might happen to be close to one slit. And then at, at a critical time before the, the, um, uh, before the end of the protocol, you switch strategies and you say, okay, whichever slit I'm closest to, I will steer to, 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 to make it go through that slit. So it's, it's a strategy that can be advantageous because since the variance is comparable to the, to the separation of the slits, by chance, a reasonable fraction of the times you'll be fairly close to one and you won't need to steer it much. If, if you can find it more closely, then you'd always have to steer it, you know, half the distance between them. If you can find it too far, you could be far away, but there's just the right amount of slop to give it. Um, and then you, you go to the closest one. But the really interesting thing from my point of view is that, that there's, a, there's a, an analytic switch in strategies that, that's kind of like a phase transition. That happens at a specific time where you switch modes from just waiting with the right with the right amount of sort of slop to steering towards the nearest target, and so the 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 point of introducing this example and going way too fast on on the formalism was just to say that in these nonlinear kinds of problems um, you can get things like phase transitions and strategy. And that's a new qualitative thing that arises from the nonlinearity of the problem. We'll, we'll see another example of this uh, tomorrow, of course. But I just wanted to give a, a, a first first one that comes out of this kind of thing. So so again, this is something where we're, we're ignoring any observation issues and things like that. Of course, that can that get complicated, but um, this 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 kind of thing can happen. Yeah. Uh, the switch where it uh, changes from just giving it randomly to choosing uh, with uh, various uh, various years. Uh, what does it depend on the, the, the time that it switches? Oh, um, it it uh, depends on on this on how much you you weight the control. 
So um, if R is, uh, let's see, that's, um, no, okay, I don't have the details here, I'm sorry. But, but if R is, is large, so that control is very, um, it, it's influenced by the time bar because it's, it's, it's how much control you, you, you want to use. So, so it's not dependent on the distance or the particle from the wall. Yeah, yeah. Control. So it's trying to say that okay, now that it's here, I'm going to have to apply some some control, and, and depending on on uh, um, how costly that control is, then I would choose different times. And then the and it also depends on the control. So. I have a question. I mean, um, if I am trying to combine the first part of the lecture with the second, no? imagine you have to you want to control a system with an optional protocol. So you first design it by using these techniques we have just explained, and then uh, you implement them in, in your system and try to measure with the strategies that we have explained first in the first part of the lecture, right? And yes. you first design the protocol with the optimal control theory we have just explained, and then with the, the problem of measuring and predicting and correcting your mistakes <clears throat> is Related with the first part of the lecture, right? Yeah, but the, 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 the thing I was trying to say about with the example where we were confusing the particle with a, um, a cover where you couldn't see it in the center, but you could outside, yes. um, is that that the natural thing to do, which is just what you said, which is just you know figure out a way to do the estimation problem so you can estimate your state and figure out, given the state, what's the right control. That's only fully optimal in the case of a linear, you know, linear dynamics. Most of the time you're dealing with nonlinear things, or often when it's dealing with nonlinear things. And then you have, you have to check how good that is. That that may not be, you know, there may be some coupled estimation control algorithm that is better. So you have to prove that that's the right thing to do in, in, in general case of nonlinear dynamics. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So that's that's what I had today. Um, so just just for tomorrow, um, tomorrow's going to be a little bit different. We'll have a first half where I want to revisit this estimation problem um, from the point of view of, of Bayesian inference. So um, it'll lead to the same thing, but the viewpoint is is different than and. Um, I'm not sure. I, the, the advantage of doing things the way that I just did is, first of all, that's kind of the historical way that they were developed. But second, it's a, I would say, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a very seat of the pants approach that, that we base it on. Uh, uh, you know, we have a covariance of, of uh, a variance of, of, of uh, uh, errors that we make, and we're just trying to tune this game uh, to, to minimize that. So it's a, it's a pretty, Simple approach, although the algebra is complicated, the, the concepts are simple. Um, in the Bayesian approach, it's maybe a little more abstract, but but once you get the hang of it, it's, it's, it's I think a more elegant way to look at it, and and also suggests how to do this um, kind of filtering process or state estimation in cases where the dynamics are not linear. Like we we've, we've just done it for for a linear system, but you can do the same kind of thing for a nonlinear system as well. And so it's, it's the way to go for that. So, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then for the, for the first part, and then the second part, I'll kind of shift gears into more of a seminar mode and present some work that we've just done that uses all of these concepts. Okay, so we're, we're almost there. The, again, I'm sorry for all the, the glitches. The, we'll see you maybe we'll figure out the tomorrow. So, Thank you very much, John. Uh, today, one more great lecture. So I would just uh, like to remind all in-person participants uh, for tomorrow's session and for the sessions that were later today, if we could try to be on time uh, because of lectures, but 